Hi everyone, and welcome back to the 31st video for the New Testament Survey course. In this section, we'll look at Paul's second epistle to Timothy. The background of this book is similar to the other pastoral epistles. The author is still Paul, and he referred to himself as an apostle of Christ. And the recipient is still Timothy, and Paul called him his dear son. However, in contrast to 1 Timothy, this book is mostly personal to Timothy himself and was not really written to address the church which Timothy was leading. And the date of writing was around 65 to 67 AD. That's very near the end of Paul's life, and this is almost certainly the last New Testament letter which Paul wrote. Now let's look at the occasion of this book, and we'll do it in comparison to the occasion of 1 Timothy. Some things were still the same. Timothy was still in Ephesus, and Paul was still exhorting and encouraging him, and apparently the false teachers were still influential in the church. But some things had changed. Paul was now back in prison in Rome, and like I mentioned, this book is less about the church and more about Timothy personally. And Timothy was entrusting the church to the leadership of others in order to leave and be with Paul. Because Paul knew that his time was short. He was in prison and about to be executed. So in this book, Paul gave a sense of loneliness and desire for Timothy to visit him soon. And there were exhortations for Timothy to remain loyal to Paul personally as well as to the gospel. But ultimately, this book is about God's faithfulness because Paul displayed a deep conviction about God's goodness and faithfulness even as he was about to die. And so, the purpose of this book was to be a testamental charge to Timothy, Paul's close friend and helper. Similar to the way that today some terminally ill parents will record a final message for their kids, Paul is giving some final heartfelt instructions to his spiritual son. Paul included some instructions for Timothy to leave with the church, but the bulk of this book is personal instructions to Timothy himself. Paul charged Timothy to always be loyal, to always be loyal to Christ, to always be loyal to the gospel, and thereby to always be loyal to, to Timothy's own ministry calling. Also, Timothy was asked to remain loyal to Paul, even in Paul's suffering and impending death. And Paul was request, requesting Timothy to come see him as soon as possible. Timothy was to entrust the church work to trustworthy people, and then to go visit Paul quickly in Rome before he was put to death. Now, let's look at the organization and outline of 2 Timothy. After the standard epistle introduction, Paul appealed to Timothy to remain loyal, to remain loyal to Paul in his imprisonment and suffering, but especially to remain loyal to Christ and his gospel, and Timothy's own call to proclaim the gospel. Paul gave thanks for Timothy's Christian upbringing and then encouraged him to remain faithful to the gospel and to sound teaching. Then, Paul mentioned that many had abandoned him in his imprisonment, but he honored those who had continued to help him. He then encouraged Timothy's faithfulness by using three metaphors about serving, like a soldier, like an athlete, and like a farmer. And he urged Timothy to remain faithful by reminding him that God is always just and faithful. Then, in the next section, Paul gave Timothy some final warnings about false teaching. He advised him how to work against false teaching, basically by being a good teacher of the word of truth. He counseled him not to be quarrelsome, but to patiently teach, hoping that God will grant repentance. And Paul also soberly warned Timothy that he should expect to encounter false teachers, because evil days will be characterized by evil people. And the next section is how Timothy should respond. It is Paul's final charge for Timothy to proclaim the true teaching of Christ. Paul reminded Timothy of the scriptures, which are inspired by God and useful for all things, and which make people wise for salvation. Therefore, Timothy was to proclaim the word in many ways, even against opposition. And Paul mentioned his own preaching example of faithfulness 
and the reward he soon expected, as the reason why Timothy should carry on the work. And the next section is Paul's final personal words to Timothy. He instructed Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. He warned Timothy about a dangerous man named Alexander, and he gave thanks that God had supported him in his trial, even when others had abandoned him. And he expressed his hope for the continued success of the gospel and for God's faithfulness to bring Paul into the full experience of his kingdom at last. And then this epistle ends with the standard greetings and conclusion. That is the organization of 2 Timothy. So now, let's look at the content of this book. In general, this is one of Paul's most passionate and personal books. He was writing very intimate stuff about his own life to a dear friend. And therefore, this book is a little sad and somber, because Paul knew he was about to die, and he was feeling lonely and abandoned to a certain degree. But at the same time, this book is still joyful and victorious, because Paul was still full of confidence in Christ's provision for the rest of his life, as well as his eternal reward, which he was certain he would soon experience. Through all the ups and downs, Paul knew with a certainty that God was good and would never fail to fulfill all his promises. And also notice, throughout this book, how often Paul reminded Timothy of his own history, both of Timothy's own experiences and background, but also of Paul's example and teaching which Timothy had witnessed throughout their years together. The proof of God's faithfulness, which Timothy had already known, was used as the motivation to encourage him to remain faithful. God had never failed Timothy, and he was to live and work in the confidence that God never would. Now let's look at a few key verses to give us a deeper sense of the content of 2 Timothy. First in chapter 1, verses 8 through 12 says, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed an herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is what I am, suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. In this passage, Paul told Timothy not to be ashamed, but rather to be willing to join in suffering on behalf of the gospel. And he rehearsed some implications of the gospel as encouragement. God saved him and called him to a holy life. And this is never because of us or our deeds, but it is because of God's purpose and grace given before time. But this is all now revealed in Jesus the Savior who destroyed death and brought eternal life through the gospel. Paul then reminded Timothy that he personally was suffering for this gospel, but was not ashamed, because he was confident in God and convinced of God's faithfulness. His advice to Timothy and to us is to settle deep in your mind and heart the truth of the gospel and the character of God, and this will be a solid foundation for fearless faithfulness to this God and his gospel. Next is chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, which says, What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. In this passage, Paul encouraged Timothy to remain faithful to the pattern of sound teaching that he had received. That is, the framework, the pattern, the outline. Not necessarily the exact words, but the same truth 
the same gospel tradition as we mentioned in Thessalonians. Paul proclaimed it, and Timothy learned it, and he was to keep it with faith and love. But this is not automatic. Timothy needed to be careful to guard this good deposit given into his care with the help of God's Holy Spirit. It is the truth of the gospel which is the powerful reality with which Timothy was to build his own life and ministry. But he was also to pass it on to others, as we'll see in the next passage, which is chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. In this passage, Timothy was again urged to remain loyal to the grace of Christ. And one of the ways he was to do this was to keep hold of the truth which he received from Paul, which Paul had publicly proclaimed to many people in Timothy's presence. Timothy was to make these things his very own, but he was also to pass them on to a third generation of leaders. And he was to do it in such a way that these men will then be able to teach and raise up a fourth generation. This is the ideal of ministry, to pass the baton on to others who will continue the expansion and renewal of the gospel, multiplying its reach to the ends of the earth. Because reaching the world for Christ is not all on Paul and Timothy. They certainly did their part, but they've been deceased for quite a while now. It is now up to those of us who are alive today. And part of our responsibility is to keep firm the truth of Christ in our own lives, but also to pass it on to the next generations. Always be thinking long term and live today in a way that will be a blessing to your great-grandchildren, and serve Christ in a way that will impact the people who will be reached with the gospel by the people that you reach with the gospel. And then chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In this passage, Paul reminded Timothy of the gospel he preached. It is about Jesus, who is the Davidic King Messiah, but who was also raised from the dead after dying on the cross. And Paul was suffering in chains for this gospel. But Paul immediately expressed confidence that God's word was in no way held back by this. The gospel is effective, even if Paul is out of the picture. And he thought being imprisoned was worth it for the sake of the gospel, just like he had expressed back in Philippians. You see, Paul was willing to endure anything and everything for Christ, and he wanted Timothy to continue to have this same attitude. Because the goal is salvation and eternal glory. And what a great motivation that is to stand firm for Christ. Paul was completely captivated by this, and he passed on this mindset to Timothy. And I hope that we embrace this conviction as well. Then in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Scripture says, Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. These verses continue Paul's instructions to Timothy how he can be a faithful minister. He was to continue to proclaim the truth of God without getting sidetracked into needless controversies. Timothy was to be a good workman with no reason to be ashamed. Timothy was to work hard. And Paul defined what this meant as correctly handling the word of truth, to accurately, fearlessly, and faithfully proclaim God's truth is the way that Timothy will present himself as an offering to God. 
And no one who aspires to be a good minister and Christian leader can ever do so without likewise following this very same advice. Be strong in the word of truth. This is the key to successful Christian leadership. And it's the protection for all kinds of mistakes and the antidote to all kinds of false teaching and opposition. And that leads into chapter 3, verse 1, which says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And then right after this, Paul went on to describe some of the details of the terrible times and the terrible people that make the times terrible by their terrible behavior. So this verse is the introduction to Paul's warning to Timothy about evil people and evil times. And there is much, much debate about the phrase, in the last days. But whatever that means, what Paul wrote here is true to various extent at all times. And it's certainly true of our time in North America. Christians can never fall into an idealist, utopian view, utopian view of humanity. But we must be realistic about human nature without Christ. Absolutely. Hope pray, and work for the best, but also be ready for the worst. Expect the gospel to change lives, but don't be shocked by the brokenness and deceitfulness of humanity, including yourself. But how should we respond to such a grim prediction? Well, Paul tells us by what he told Timothy in the next key passage. Chapter 3, verse 14 through chapter 4, verse 5 says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. In this passage, the answer Paul gave to the falsehood described in the previous section is the truth of the gospel, the truth of the scriptures. The answer to the depravity and self-love described in the previous section is salvation in Christ. Timothy is commanded to continue in the truth, based on the track record of his predecessors, such as his mother, grandmother, and Paul himself. And he was to stick with the scriptures because they make wise for salvation by revealing Christ and engendering faith. Because the scripture is breathed out by God himself. What the Bible says, God says, because the Bible is from God himself. And therefore, it is useful for teaching us what to think, for correcting us from what we should not think, for rebuking us away from how we should not live, and for training us how to live in righteousness. And the result is that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Think carefully about this verse. Look carefully at this verse. It says, thoroughly equipped, and it says, every good work. There's nothing lacking in the scriptures. And therefore, we need to have confidence in the truth of God's Word for every situation and stop relying on worldly wisdom. Don't put your trust in a secular counselor or lawyer or politician or, God forbid, some celebrity's opinion to give you the answers and directions to deal with life's problems. But 
search the scriptures to hear from God himself, and you will find sufficient answers for every need. And because of this, Timothy's charge was to simply proclaim God's word, faithfully doing so in all situations and contexts. Realistic that it will meet a mixed reaction, just like it did for Jesus, just like it did for Paul, because sometimes people selfishly prefer a pleasant sounding lie to a challenging truth. But Timothy was to remain faithful to his call and methodology and persevere in discharging his duties, expecting God to honor his word. And that's an excellent advice for modern Christian leaders as well. These, then, are some of the key verses of this book. Now let's look at the theological themes of 2 Timothy. The first theme is the Scriptures. They're called the Word of Truth. They're inspired by God Himself, and they're useful for all things. And therefore, Timothy is encouraged to know them, to trust them, and to teach and preach them. The Bible is the foundation and main tool of any decent Christian leadership. Without the Bible, we have nothing to offer and nothing with which to defend ourselves. So dive deep into the scriptures and use them as your primary tool in every part of your life and ministry. The next theme is false teachers. Just like as in 1 Timothy, Paul commanded him to oppose false teachers. And we should all oppose false teachers, but don't be a jerk about it. We're not to engage in unnecessary, foolish controversy, but rather are to graciously instruct others with the truth. We're not to be contentious, but to pray for the repentance of the false teachers. Then the third theme is enduring hardship. Like a good soldier or athlete, Timothy is to persevere through any difficulty, to do whatever it takes for the sake of the gospel. He's to know the reason why to endure and to keep in mind the reward for enduring. Just like Paul endured and was enduring hardship, Timothy was to follow in his footsteps for the gospel and for the sake of the churches. And the fourth theme is God's faithfulness. Paul expressed his confidence that God had always been faithful and that he would continue to unfailingly work out his good purposes in Paul's life in Timothy's life, in the continuing church, and in all of human history, because that is who God is. God's faithfulness was shown in his eternal plan, which worked out in Christ's appearing in history to destroy death and bring life and immortality. It was shown in God's calling and empowering of Paul to be an apostle. It's shown in the fact that God's word cannot be chained, and God remains faithful, even if we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. God's solid foundation stands firm, and he knows those who are his. God rescued Paul from every persecution and strengthened him in his trial, and God will reward all his faithful people with the crown of life. People will be unfaithful. People will be deceived. Situations will change and sometimes get bad, but God will never change and he will always be there for his people and will eventually triumph over all his enemies. And our response to this leads into the last theme, which is loyal confidence. Or you could think of it as loyalty based on confidence. This theme means trusting in the gospel and the God of the gospel, and therefore remaining faithful to him because he is trustworthy. And it also works out in mentoring and instilling this confidence in others, and entrusting them with the truth of the gospel so that they can pass it on to others to the ends of the earth. All right, these are the themes of 2 Timothy. So now, let's review. The organization of 2 Timothy is appeal to loyalty, false teaching, true teaching, and personal words. And the themes of 2 Timothy are scriptures, oppose false teaching, endure hardship, God's faithfulness, and loyal confidence. That's all we can cover in this short survey of 2 Timothy, 
and I hope you take the opportunity later to revisit this book in more detail. But in this course, we'll move on to the next of Paul's pastoral epistles. So in the next section, we'll look at the book of Titus, and I hope you'll join us there. Thanks for watching.